In this episode, Dr. Jeff Karp discusses all things patents on intellectual property conversations with McKenna. In terms of thinking through how one might achieve impact in their career Mm -hmm. or in their work, let's call it add value to society, do something that's actually going to be meaningful to others, patents really are just an essential component of the translational process of taking discoveries and moving them towards patients and helping people. Concretely, how can patents help create translational impact? This process requires an incredible amount of money, especially when you need to go through clinical trials. And companies or investors like to have protection that there's not going to be a competitor that's going to come out and do the exact same thing or companies that could quickly learn from others and then potentially move ahead um, faster. So I think, you know, as investors or or companies, when you want to um, invest in new ideas and move things forward, you want to have some period of ownership where you're you know, protected, essentially. So the money that you're putting in, you'll be able to reap the benefits of that if everything works out for a certain period of time. I think there's examples where patents are not needed to move things forward. I think there are, are certain examples like that, but I'd say in general, it's just part of the process. So what makes a strong patent? You used to be able to file patents and they would get approved and be very broad. And I think over time that has narrowed substantially. And so you want to be in a position where you're covering your kind of core technology and ideally you're trying to you know, get that through the patent office so you can be as broad as possible. But often the strongest part of a patent is in defining the conditions where it works the best and conditions where it doesn't work. So I almost think of kind of like a a curve that might look like this, where it's like, let's say you're looking at a single variable and you're modifying that variable and you're sort of seeing like, okay, it doesn't work so well here, it doesn't work, it's starting to work, you know, and you're sort of increasing, let's say, the concentration of something. It could, could be anything. And then it starts to work and then all of a sudden it's working incredibly well. And then you keep increasing the concentration and, and then it starts not to work as well and then eventually it doesn't work at all. So that specific range of where it worked best was not obvious or you couldn't have predicted them from the beginning. A critical component of a patent is that it can't be obvious to someone who has expertise, let's say, in the field. How does the patent application process influence your approach to research? It's interesting how learning about patents has impacted my work. I've been gravitating towards thinking about patent strategy early in my work and then having the patent strategy actually dictate how some of the experiments are performed. If we show something works with one material, it'd be good to show that it can work with multiple materials so that in the patents we can claim this more broadly, that this technology applies to multiple materials, not just the material that we enabled it for. So when should a researcher file a patent application? It's a tricky question about knowing the timing of when to apply for a patent. I think that there's a number of considerations and some of them bring about opposing views. As soon as you file a patent, the clock starts ticking. Let's say you file a provisional patent. So you have one year to then convert that to a non-provisional patent, which essentially allows you to then start thinking about other places in the world that you want to go. And if you don't convert it, what you originally filed can be held confidential, you know, forever, essentially. Then if you convert that, you have another six months before that will then become public online. So there's an 18-month window from when you first file to to when it goes. From the time you file that original patent, there's someone on the order of about was it like 30 months or so or 32 months before you go to national phase where you actually have to choose which countries you want to file in. And that's when things start to get very expensive. Um, and it can be thousands or tens of thousands of dollars in each country depending on like how many claims you have and things like that and translation fees. And then the patent life is you know on the order of like 20 years or so. And it can take 10 years before something is sold as a product or even longer. You have to kind of consider that once a company you know starts selling a product, how many years of exclusivity do they essentially have? There's all sorts of like financial sort of considerations for the investment it would take to bring something to market and then how much money essentially the companies can make to then recoup that investment and then make what they had hoped, you know, as upside in addition to covering 
covering all of their costs. If you file too early, then that window that you have to block others becomes narrower and it's harder to make the financials work. But if you're working in a really hot area, chances are others are kind of thinking similar things that you're thinking and so you want to get that in as quickly as possible. Right now, it's first to file. It used to be first to invent in the United States. But if you file too early, you may miss some of the core kind of components of defining the right conditions and where it worked the best. Then you have to follow on with follow-up patents, which can actually be a good thing because it's always good to have you know, families of patents, not just one that's protecting your technology. In case one's challenged, then you have others that could actually, you know, kind of protect. You want to have a patent in place so that you can start talking to some other people about your technology so you have a certain level of protection that someone can't just, you know, go and do the same thing. Often what we'll do, you know, in the academic setting is we'll be working on a project and we'll try to push it as far as we can so that we're pretty close to publication and maybe we've even written up the publication and then we'll submit that as the, the patent to the, the patent office or just like foundational material for the patent and then once that is filed let's say as a provisional patent then we'll go ahead and submit the paper and you know sometimes these are done in parallel, there, there's a little bit of a time difference. It's okay to submit the paper and then have the patent be filed like a month or two after because a paper is considered confidential. Reviewers and everyone who are looking at it are supposed to treat it with the utmost confidential mindset possible so that they're not sharing it with others. And in that process, we'll avoid, you know, presenting at conferences or sort of talking about the technologies publicly, which is challenging because here we are in this academic setting where it's very focused on professional development of people who are in the lab and, you know, going and presenting at conferences is, is part of that process. Building communication skills and interacting with colleagues and so it can be challenging in academia to kind of manage these things. You've made your tweaks and improved your design. When can you file your next patent? There's always this question of you know, when might we file the next patent? This is always like conversation with the patent office at the institution. So another consideration is that the patent office at, at institutions have particular budgets and they get more submissions of invention disclosures than they can potentially file on. And so they have to make decisions about what to file on and what not to file on. There's, you know, some complexities associated with that and various consideration, you know, in terms of it's like a hot area, whether there's great potential for that technology to be licensed, maybe if that investigator has a lot of kind of external relationships that increase the probability of that being licensed. So that's part of the consideration of the initial filing and then also subsequent filings. Often, if there's a potential for a subsequent filing, then they're going to look at, is this enough of a departure from what you've done? Is this, you know, really going to add significant value in addition to the initial patent that is critical for products that will come out of that. As we continue to advance technologies in the lab, you know, we're constantly thinking of new applications and we're kind of coming up with tweaks on the technology to enable those new applications. It's kind of a gray area about when to file the next patent. One way of looking at it, and there are many, would be when you have a research paper, you write it up, you file it as a patent, let's say the paper comes out and the patent's moving forward. The way we typically look at it is like the next patent will be filed when we're ready to submit the next paper. The reason why that can work is because the next paper often is its own body of work. So it's an extension of what we did previously, but there's a lot of new things in there. Because sometimes you might file, let's say, on a device, and then you make a tiny tweak, and you're like, oh, it works, works better now. But it's such a small component that you might not file on that. There's no sort of like linear path in terms of how to think about these things. So how long does it take for a patent to get approved? The approval process does vary quite a bit. Part of it can also be how well financed the patent office is, what time of year it is, and you know whether they've gotten like a ton of work at a particular time. Things can kind of slow down going you know, around like holiday periods, just like anything else. And there are pathways where you can pay for accelerated processing. It doesn't necessarily mean that it'll get approved faster, but you can pay in certain circumstances for the patent office to 
take a deeper look earlier. A lot of it depends on the particular field and how much prior art there is um, that exists, what other people have done that similar or relevant that needs to be looked at. A lot of it depends on how the pattern is written, you know, how simple and focused it is. I was just gonna say, like, it's a very crowded space. It just takes more time because usually the more crowded it is, the more words you need in your claims to then focus on what is differentiated about what you're doing. Ideally, you want to have the fewest words possible in your claims to just maximize how broad you, know, you can go. And so a lot of the process, I think, involves this give and take interaction between, let's say, the company that has the IP and the, the patent office. That sort of conversation, let's call it, can take a long time as there's like this negotiation, this kind of dance that's happening going back and forth, where the company really wants to protect the products, you know, at least at the core, but they want to get as broad sort of applicability as possible to cover not just what they plan to bring to market, let's say in the coming years, but to block everything that could be related to that. Whereas the patent office is looking at it from a slightly different angle, which is what have you, you know, enabled in your examples and in your experiments and what's really the core of your intellectual property that is you know, differentiated from what others have done and, and that's protectable. And that tends to be more of like a narrow view. Now, you can accelerate that timeline by if what the patent office is kind of suggesting is covering the core concepts, then you know, there's ways to say, okay, well, we'll just, let's just get this through. And then we can potentially do like a continuation you know, later, or you'd file it before the patent was approved. So you kind of have to give something up essentially to get something to go through faster. But not all companies want to do that. And it just really depends on the business plan and the vision and the experience as well of the people who are at the table. How do patents vary between academia and the private sector? When you join an academic institution, you'll sign a bunch of kind of contracts during the onboarding process. And one of those contracts is that anything that you invent during the time that you're working for that institution and when you use the resources within that institution, you then assign all your rights to the institution, essentially, for your patents. Let's say, you know, kind of further down the road, there's a opportunity to form a new company. Then that new company will have a lawyer or the CEO, both will then go to the institution and negotiate a license of that intellectual property into the new company. Then there's certain terms associated with that. Often it's like, you know, combination of some equity and then there's payment of the patent costs. There's kind of yearly maintenance fees, milestone payments, some royalties. If a product gets to market, so a certain percentage of the sales will go back. If the company does deals with other companies, it's kind of sub-licensing deals and there'll be some financials that will also come back to the institution. And then the investigators who are involved there's also like splits that occur within the academic institution you know and it depends on, on the institution they have different different kind of policies when you're within a company and patents are filed then it's a similar type contract where during your time let's say for consulting for that company you will then assign all the rights in a particular field to that company and then the company will you know own that intellectual property and then it's really up to them to figure out how to leverage that to develop products and support the products that they're developing with those patents. There's different sense in terms of institutions that are easier to work with and harder to work with. These things are constantly kind of changing and it's hard to kind of predict, you know, investors in general, they'll kind of be agnostic in terms of like where the intellectual property actually lies, but be very focused on the ability to get the right intellectual property to be licensed with reasonable terms as quickly as possible that then will protect those technology platforms that are being pushed forward into products. How does the international nature of your work impact your patent strategy? Two of the companies that I've co-founded are based in Paris. The others are based in the United States. From a patenting perspective, I don't know whether there's that much difference in terms of the patent strategy. The companies that I've been associated with really all see themselves as, as global companies and so they're looking to get patent protection in you know the biggest markets that exist um, for this 
specific products that are being developed. In general, when you're filing patents, you're going to go to the United States and Europe. A lot of people will file in Japan and, and in Canada, for example, you know, maybe Brazil. Sometimes in companies that are based in certain countries, there's a tendency maybe to file only in those countries, depending on the company size and, and the vision and you know, what they're trying to, to achieve. Finally, how has your view of patents changed over time? You know, I used to think that patents were about technology. We'd come up with the technology and then we would submit it. But the more that I've learned about patents, the more that I've realized that the best patent strategy is one where the patents to some degree impact and alter the process of how the work occurs. In general, you know, the strongest patents are the ones where not only you're describing the technology, but the conditions where it works the best. By knowing that, by knowing that that's where the strongest component of the patent is, when you're conducting your experiments, you, you want to be able to define those ranges of where things work and where things don't work. And that can actually be very informative to the academic community as well, when people are trying to learn from what you've done. So it's not like you've just created a technology and shown you've achieved, let's say, a result that no one's achieved before. You've actually looked in depth at individual variables and, and looked at, let's say, more of the parameter space. So you've taken these individual variables and you haven't just looked at like one or two concentrations, you've looked at 10. And, and so that can help others to really determine in their experiments, you know, which concentrations to try. And then from a patent perspective, that can help because you can identify these non-obvious regimes of where things work the best. By being more thorough, that helps both the patents in terms of, you know, the strength of the patents and, and how you might be able to frame the claims. So it gives you more optionality, but then it also helps academic colleagues who are looking at the work and trying to, you know, replicate it or make decisions about their work based on your work. So when the more you sort of explore that parameter space, I think the better for everything. Many thanks to Dr. Karp for his time and insights. If you enjoyed this interview, please like, subscribe, and share for more.